Um, the underlying disorder that made up the majority of patients was ALS, uh, about 58 percent. The CNS-LS score, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail, but you can see that that value um, of 13.8 or around 14 was less than what it had been uh, in the patients that were in the double blind at baseline. So these are, these are baseline values. <clears throat> so the baseline starting CNS-LS score was around 20, 21 um, at the beginning of the double blind phase. Um, at the beginning, so the baseline of the open label extension, it had decreased down to 14. And this is an indication of the efficacy of this drug that we found in the first trial, in the, in the double blind 12 week trial that preceded this open label. So we already have now achieved uh, an improvement of the CNS LS score. And as I say, I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail what that means. The very bottom line that, that you see on that table is talking about the rate uh, of these episodes uh, daily. And these were not being assessed in the open label phase, but, but again, you can see that, just to give you an idea, these episodes that individuals were, were experiencing were in the neighborhood of, if you calculate these daily rates on a weekly basis, uh, about 33 per week for those patients that were in the 30 uh, milligram uh, group, 43 per week, so a little bit more uh, in the patients that were in the 20 milligram dextromethorphan group, and about 32 per week in the placebo group. So this is kind of the context of, of um, the severity of, of their PBA that they are experiencing. Now, it's pretty easy to um, understand what daily episodes are. So it's the number of times that an individual may have experienced uh, one of these outbursts of crying or laughing uh, on a daily basis. And so this was the primary endpoint of the double blind study. A secondary endpoint, however, for the double blind study and then the primary kind of efficacy measure that was obtained in this open label extension was the CNS-LS score. CNS-LS, as you'll see on, on the measure of efficacy um, sheet, stands for Center for Neurologic Study Lability Scale. This is a scale that has been, had been developed and um, validated uh, in, in several studies now to really be an indicator of the severity of the pseudobulbar affect symptoms that patients may experience, rather than looking at numbers of, of episodes that they may have, but it's really the overall severity of either the laughter or the crying. And some patients will actually experience a combination of the two and not even realize whether they're laughing or crying, but it'll be kind of a mixture. Um, so this is a, a scale that is based on a, uh, a range. It's seven questions, very easily administered. It's something that the patient will answer, uh, self-administered essentially. Um, and it has seven questions that can range then a score from seven to 35. The maximum that one can have is five per question. So the maximum overall score, which is the worst, so higher numbers are worse, is 35. The best number that a person could have for the CNS, normal, without any pseudobulbar affect symptoms, is seven. So as you can see, to enroll in this trial, in the initial double-blind study, a patient had to have at least a 13 on their CNS-LS. 13 is considered, based on the validation studies, to be kind of the threshold for when an individual may, may start to manifest clinical symptoms of pseudobulbar affect, at least for, for physicians that may be attentive to that. But once one gets up to a number of around 20, 21, which is what we saw as the baseline of the majority of, of the, kind of the mean baseline for all individuals when they started the double blind phase, once you get around 20, 21, then it becomes really, really very obvious that an individual's having pseudobulbar affect. So the cutoff, the clinical threshold cutoff that was required was the 13. And as you, as you saw on the vertical dotted lines that we were obtaining this measure uh, on a regular basis throughout the study. So then, as far as the results are concerned, there were 283 patients who completed the double blind trial. Of these 283, um, 253 or 89%, so almost 90% of individuals entered the open label extension trial. Um, the, the score, that CNS-LS score that I indicated to explain to you, um, 
started off uh, now reduced, if you recall from the previous uh, figure, the table there, that it was a 13.8 uh, at their baseline of, of starting this open label extension. So it, that was the, the baseline at which they started the open label extension, and that decreased by week 12 down to 11.2. We'll be able to see this a little bit more clearly um, on the uh, figure two, which is the next sheet. So this is really um, a reduction, a mean change in the CNS LS from the baseline at the time of open label baseline to week 12 of minus 2.7 points. So a reduction of almost three points in the CNS LS score, which was highly significant from the baseline. So this was all, all comers. As one looked at which patients initially had started off in either the, the DMQ30 group, the DMQ20 group, or the placebo group, if you broke them down by those groups that where they started in the double-blind phase, these reductions became most obvious in the group that had initially been in the placebo arm, which kind of makes sense, but it, it really does indicate that, that they were the ones that had the most significant benefit with the medication once they started on the drug. Interestingly, the patients that had initially been in the DM20 group also had um, an improvement. The ones that had started off in the DM30 as you wouldn't really expect that they would improve, didn't really uh, change very much. But overall, there was, again, a statistically significant reduction of uh, the CNS-LS score. If you look at, the, um, at that uh, final figure, figure two, you can see, I think, pictorially, very clearly, how the reduction of CNS-LS scores uh, occurred. So again, we're, for the, pre for the present um, presentation, I'm focusing on the right-hand half of that figure, uh, figure two, showing you the, the reduction from a 13.8 um, open label baseline down to really 11.2 uh, score. And you can see that horizontal broken line as being the 13 level, which is the threshold uh, that one, is, one considers the CNS-LS score to identify clinically obvious PBA. Um, if you just want to look, look to the left-hand side, you can see the individual groups uh, from the double-blind study uh, with the placebo group being the ones that really don't get down low enough to, to break through that threshold. So they, they are still above that 13 uh, score of CNS uh, LS, but the other uh, two groups that are the treatment groups, the DMQ30 and 20, both dip down below the clinical threshold, and, and that is uh, very highly significant statistically compared to placebo. So I think that, that um, this figure really captures the, the kind of the real key point of this study that, that there is a continued improvement, uh, incremental improvement over the 12 week period in this open label phase uh, of all patients that are participating in it and taking DMQ30 um, uh, drug uh, dosing and that this, that this improvement is most uh, significant in those individuals that had initially started off in the placebo arm. Uh, it also demonstrates a long-term uh, safety and tolerability. Um, I'm not talking about the, the sort of the safety uh, um, adverse event uh, profile uh, in this presentation today. We do have a poster uh, that is being presented at this meeting um, that you're welcome to come and see that addresses primarily the adverse events um, over this open label phase, which I can tell you were, were very low and um, uh, demonstrating that there's uh, protracted um, efficacy and safety and tolerability of, of this drug in long-term um, applications. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Piorio. Uh, we can take a few questions now. Um, if